I'll say, Kelsey, since you were the one who watched the movie, you can choose which one to start. Uh, let's go chapter 20 for 500. Chapter 20 for 5. They're not big. Woo! All right. A man comes into the ED due to worsening back pain and not passing urine for 24 hours. You take this man's vitals and find that his blood pressure is 140 over 100. The <coughs> labs show that his blood sodium is high, his blood potassium sorry, is low, and an ultrasound of the, man, the man's mid-back shows a tumor on the left. What hormone is likely being over-secreted and from what gland? Is it a red hormone? What's your guess? Yes. From what gland? I can't remember. It's not, actually it's not ADH. Okay, cool. It's not ADH. Aldosterone. Aldosterone. Good. And aldosterone comes from what gland? Perfect. Yeah. And what were, what were clues from this that it was aldosterone? <coughs> Yeah, good. Potassium is low because aldosterone did what? For the potassium. Yeah, potassium causes him to pee out the potassium, the aldosterone does, right? And retain the sodium. That's why his sodium is high. Okay, good. And um, worsening back pain. Why back pain? Yeah, yep, it's a little bit of that. In addition to it, he's got a big tumor in his back, yeah. right? That's another, but you're, you're not wrong. Yeah. Because where your kidneys are located, too. Exactly, and that's where the kidneys are. And the <coughs> adrenal glands are on top of the kidney. Good. Um, why is his blood pressure so high? Because his sodium is high. Yeah, he's retaining all this sodium. Like, so his sodium is really high, which means his blood volume is really high, which makes your blood pressure higher. Good. Excellent. That was good. Aldosterone from the adrenal gland. Um, so I'm going to teach you. What? I thought they were team one. I think it's team one, team two. Oh, okay. Because you're, yeah. Yeah, I'm backwards. Yeah. Okay, this Team two. We're team two. Yeah. Team two. Yeah. I don't know. We're this one. But um, on the same kind of. Uh, topic with hormones, you said antidiuretic hormone, why wouldn't it be antidiuretic hormone? Why wouldn't that presentation that we read because about? Okay, well if you had a tumor that was secreting antidiuretic hormone, you also probably wouldn't be making yeah, much urine, right? Because of ADH. What's that? Because of ADH. ADH. ADH? Um, yes, but what does ADH do? It opens up. Yeah, it's just, it just absorbs water. Tons and tons of water, right? With no electrolytes. You're still kind of like getting rid of your electrolytes because you're not reabsorbing them necessarily because of the ADH. So, in that setting, if he had a tumor that was secreting ADH, what would you expect his sodium levels to be? Yeah, because you've got a whole bunch of extra water that's diluting. His potassium would be high. His potassium also would be low. Likely, because you're reabsorbing all this water and it dilutes everything. Yeah, so if you were to look at all of his electrolytes, they probably would all be on the low side. Make sense because he's reabsorbing so much water, yeah. Very good, very good. Um, boom, um, 21 500. Oh, nice. 21 to 500. Get rid of all the fun first, all right. 
A two-year-old child was brought into the ED in January with severe respiratory distress that has been worsening over the past 24 hours. After history and physical exam, it is determined to most likely be due to an RSV infection. If you were to take an arterial blood gas and urinalysis at the time of their arrival at the ED, what would you expect the following labs to be? High, low, or normal, okay? So if you were to measure CO2, pH, urine hydrogen, urine potassium. Okay. Which means that it would be acidic. Acidic, which means the pH would be higher or low? High. Low. 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 Everything else is being, everything else is more acidic, and the kidneys can't, like, the kidneys are trying to get rid of all that. Yes, yeah, good. Kidneys are um, compensating, right, by peeing out a lot of the hydrogen. So the urine hydrogen would be relatively high. Good. What about urine potassium? Low. Low? Low. Low. So it would be high. Remember, you've got three options, high, low, or normal. 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 Yeah, there's nothing really in this that would indicate that there would be a, an issue. I just kind of threw that in there as a red herring to see, like, oh, uh, right? Because likely his, uh, his or her blood, sh or blood pressure is fine and wouldn't require, or sorry, wouldn't lead to like aldosterone being up or down. Does that make sense? <coughs> the only problem here is the breathing. Okay, so what? condition would this two-year-old have? Um, well, RSV infection, yes, but uh, the, the state of their blood. It's an acidosis of some sort. <clears throat> yes. What, but metabolic or respiratory? Respiratory. Respiratory. Yes. So this would be respiratory acidosis. That's what they have, right? Some infection, problem with their lungs. breathing, their lungs, is causing a pH imbalance. Is, so, is a cap gas, no, I guess it's not. A cap gas isn't arterial, it's capillary. But mm -hmm. can you determine the same with a cap gas as you can with an arterial? Um, probably to an extent, it's just that as, as the blood, the reason they do the arterial is because it gives them a good snapshot of the state of their blood. The thing is that as, it, as the blood moves to the capillary, <laughs> then it's going to naturally, even in under normal circumstances, the CO2 will be a little bit higher, and then so it throws it off a little bit. Okay, so that's the reason why, so the reason why I'm asking is because like a lot of my respiratory kids have like heart lines, mm -hmm. and we draw from heart lines, but then my other kids, we do capillary, Yeah, you, you pro I mean, in theory, yeah, you could. You could definitely find that out. But it's more accurate, like, in real time, because, like, the art line, when we check their blood pressure, that's going on, like, in real time. So we're going to do an arterial blood gas because it's, like, real time. Right. Yep. Beans. Yes, and then the, the test that they, for someone who doesn't have an art line, would be to take it from, well, one common place is from their radial artery right here. And I've been told that it's very uncomfortable. So I'm guessing with kids especially, uh, they want to avoid that if they can. They don't have to do that. So the cap gas is probably. Well, why do they give all the fat little babies, like the fat ones, the fat ones, all like radial heart lines? Well, I think if you get an arm, I don't know, that's a good question. They probably are able to put them out for that procedure. 
don't know. I mean, most of my babies are sedated, right? So, because yeah. I mean, it's a cardiac unit and a PQ. Most of them are sedated and intubated. But, like, my <coughs> really fat kids, like the fatties that I love so much, they they don't have, like, anything else. They're always on their radio. Is it just because they're fat and that's the easiest way to get through it? Because you've got all that, like, extra fat on top of... Like normal like, little kid fat? Yeah, like in terms of the accessibility of the radio mm -hmm. degree, yeah, it's really easy to access because there's not, uh, generally, even in everybody, there's generally not very much like, fat or in the wrist. It's pretty easy to access. <coughs> yep, yeah, that's it. I love them. They're my favorite. Right, I love chunky babies. All right, so on, on the same um, idea <coughs> here, so give me a scenario of a person, okay, kind of, what's a scenario where you would find a person who is in respiratory alkalosis? So this is respiratory acidosis. So this is kind of the good, the so good thing about studying, right? You kind of make up your own questions, say why this answer is wrong and this one's right. So if we have our they're probably breathing heavier. Yes. Well, they have RSV. They're like trying to breathe. Like, yeah. But they have it's respiratory not all distress. Coming out. Yes. So yep. breathing <laughs> opposite. Yeah. You're breathing too hard coming out, but not enough going in, right? For this one? No, no, no. Opposite. For an alkalosis. Yeah, for alkalosis, you've got too much gas exchange. So it would be like a low level. In the blood. Yes. Yep. Yeah, but what we're talking about. I keep wanting to say, like, hypothetically, that that would be the same as ours. That would be the same for me. What? Hyperventilating. Hyperventilating makes you breathe out more than like a brain attack. Yeah. More, more makes you breathe out more CO2. Okay. <coughs> yep. So the question you've got, I mean, the, the way to break it down is this. Because there's respiratory distress, there's all sorts of mucus clogging up different bronchioles in RSV, in pneumonia, in all these things, right? Um, and so what's happening is overall less gas exchange is happening because you've got so much mucus that's cutting off so many different lobes of the lung. Does that make sense? Air can't flow through some bronchioles because it's clogged up with mucus. Does that make sense? So there's overall less gas exchange happening, which means that you have CO2 retention. You're not able to blow it out because there's less gas exchange. And that's why you get this picture with this high CO2 in the blood, high hydrogen, low pH. So if you flip it, if you have too much gas exchange, that means your CO2 levels in your blood will be low, your pH will be high, and just the opposite. Okay, so it comes down to how much gas exchange is happening. So in an asthma attack, right, what's happening is they're breathing and they're not able to exhale. <coughs> yeah, so the overall gas exchange is up high or low in an asthma attack? Low. Low, low. right, exactly, because even though they're really trying, they're in respiratory distress, they're just not able to have enough gas exchange. So you have CO2 retention and all that stuff. start from the beginning. Anything acidosis means that the pH will be low, right? And what is normal range? Normal, yeah, 7.35 to 7.45. Yeah, 7.3 would be an example, something that's going to be too acidic, right? pH is going to be less than 7.35, okay? That's just acidosis, right? 
Contrast that with alkalosis. Exactly. Greater than 7.45. Okay? So that's your starting off. So if you were given a question and said something like this, and they give you the pH, and you have four options, respiratory alkalosis, respiratory acidosis, metabolic acidosis, metabolic alkalosis. You can look at the pH and say, okay, if it's below this, I can eliminate both alkalosis. It's not alkalosis because the pH is too low. Does that make sense? They're not alkalotic, okay? So we'll just start with acidosis. And we'll just do respiratory, so respiratory and acidosis. So pH, less than 7.35. So if the pH is too low and it's acidic, that means that the hydrogen is going to be <coughs> high or low? High. Yeah, high. We know that, right? And based on of this equation that we know, when the hydrogen's high, we know that the CO2 is also high. They both go up and both go down together. So we know that the CO2 in the blood, this is, these are both in the blood, in blood, is also going to be high. So the pH would be high, CO2 would be high. Yep. Well, the pH would be low. Hydrogen would be high. Yeah. And because we know that the kidneys compensate for the lungs and the lungs compensate for the body, metabolic stuff, we know that the kidneys, to compensate for this, are going to be peeing out hydrogen. Hydrogen, right? To help bring the pH. Or sorry, bring the hydrogen in your blood back down to a normal level. And that would bring your CO2 down, and that would also make you feel a balance of pH. Yes. Be in range. Yep. The problem is this, with this, the kidneys, remember we talked about the kidneys are really slow to compensate. It takes days for them to compensate, right? The lungs are pretty fast, but if your lungs are out, because of RSV, for example, it takes days. So sometimes these guys need to get some extra help. There you go. Drugs are good. You heard it here, folks. Exactly. All right. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> we had a conversation about that yesterday. He knows not to take any meds. That parents don't get this. He's very good. Acidosis, the pH is low. Alkalosis, the pH is high. Yep. So you can know those basics, then like that can help you to rule out certain. So I'll we'll just kind of go on this one. So if the pH is high, that means that the hydrogen level is going to be low, low, low which means low. that the CO2 level is going to be low. low. Good. Which means that the kidneys will be elevated. all the things that are well. Yeah, they'll be conserving. And it'll be very diluted. It'll be mostly water. Hydrogen. And Well, it's, it's, we'll do a lot more of those things when it's related to blood pressure and that kind of thing. But it's just talking about the pH. Okay. It's not going to do that necessarily. But yeah, but it is going to be conserving hydrogen, which is an electrolyte. So you are right there. Okay? Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. And then, um, but where we were getting with the whole diet, like looking at this, one thing that you can ask yourself from the question stem is, are they breathing too much? Or, I'm sorry, is there too much gas exchange or not enough gas exchange? If there's too much gas exchange, then it means you're blowing off too much CO2, which means that your blood levels will be low of CO2. If you're not 
having enough cannabis <coughs> genes, like in RSV, respiratory distress, or um, like an asthma attack, then your CO2 levels will be high because you're not able to breathe it, out. breathe it out, expire. But if you had like a panic attack, you would have then, a respiratory outburst yes. because you would be breathing too heavily and too much, mm -hmm. and you'd be losing, you'd have too high gas. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So the kidneys compensate. So if we were to do metabolic, so if it if it's too high, if it's too low, is that what makes you pass out? Uh huh. Because you've got a lack of oxygen. Yeah, and your pH. Yeah, your pH can also just cause issues as well. Yeah. Because like low blood pressure makes you pass out. But like I've had panic attacks where I've passed out. Kelsey has. She told us. Uh huh. Um, but could you pass out from <coughs> respiratory acidosis? Because everything's too high? Um, sorry, say that again. Respiratory acidosis? Yeah, it's like respiratory acidosis. Uh, yeah, yeah. In theory, yeah. Any of these could cause you to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, metabolic acidosis, you so. can Yes, the pH is going to be less than 7.35. And so there's going to be some, because this is not respiratory, we're not going to be dealing with the same metrics, right? Because your so, hydrogen and oxygen should be normal. Um, not necessarily. Because <laughs> in the pH, if your pH is low, that means that your hydrogen it's is. It's going to be high. Yeah. It's going to be high. But the reason is going to be some, you're, you're either taking in too much acid into your body or you are losing too much base, right? And like I told you before, think of, in your mind, diarrhea, like prolonged diarrhea, just associate that with base, you're losing base, okay? So if you have prolonged diarrhea and you're losing too much base, what would result? Well, just with your overall pH. Oh, your pH would be more acidic. Yeah, exactly. It'd be more acidic. So that'd be like metabolic acidosis. So like uh, prolonged diarrhea, I'll say. Okay? Good. And so, because <coughs> your hydrogen levels are too high, what are you, what's your lungs going to do? Because your lungs compensate for this, right? How is your lungs going to be doing? Yes. So your respiratory rate will be higher or lower than normal? It'll be higher. Yes. Does that make sense? Because you're trying to blow out CO2, lower the CO2, which is going to lower the hydrogen. Does that say prolonged? Diarrhea. Yes. Diarrhea. Yeah. Okay, but Sorry. didn't you just say if you had a long diarrhea, you're losing too much base, so your pH level would be higher? But on that, doesn't it say that your pH would be? Well, the lower the pH, the more it's sitting. That's right. That's right. Oh my it's gosh. It's opposite. It's opposite. Yeah. I hate that. Yeah, it's that is confusing. Alkalosis, pH is going to be above 7.45. Your hydrogen is going to be going to be low. Good. And so, what would be any, something that causes metabolic alkalosis? Constipation. Constipation. Sure. Not enough. Uh, there's, a, but there are better ones. What's that? Vomiting. Vomiting. Yeah, you're getting rid of. You're losing that acid. Right, hydrochloric acid. So the remaining body, what's left, is basic. Good. What's another one? Okay. 
Um, another example that they gave in uh, slides was if you took too many antacids. Yes, that's right. Right? Yeah. Antacids are basic, right? If you neutralize all your stomach acid, then your net pH will be a little bit basic. Good. So, we'll say vomiting or antacids, like excess antacids. Taking a little bit is okay. Um, and so, to compensate for this, your respiratory rate will be low. 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 Because your hydrogen is low. Yes, so your body wants to raise the hydrogens up to a normal level. And in order to do that, the lungs can do what with CO2? Well, basically, you can breathe less to retain CO2. So your CO2 levels go up in your blood. And if your CO2 levels in your blood go up, your hydrogen goes up. Yeah, the hydrogen levels go up, right? Based on this equation. That makes sense? Yes. Pretty cool. Yeah? All right, good. Um, so that's all of those, kind of the, the nuts and bolts of those. Questions? All right, we spent. So people with Crohn's, are they more susceptible to metabolic abstinences? <clears throat> you probably should have split this into three teams so you could give yourself points as needed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what did you say about Crohn's? So people with Crohn's, are they, like, with persistent diarrhea, are they Yeah, yep, when they're having that kind of attack. Patients. If, that would yeah, be, that would be a, it's diarrhea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, during those attacks. Yeah, when they're having that. That's definitely something they want to keep in mind. So if somebody comes in and they're you know, like to the clinic or to the ED and you're there and they're having this prolonged diarrhea and you notice that their respiratory rate is like is a little bit on the high side. Normally it's 12 to 20 breaths per minute. But let's say they're breathing at like 23. Don't panic. Like <sighs> they're respiratory distress. They need to, you know, they're probably just compensating for their pH. Anyway, anyway, just this thing to think about. So who got that one? I think it was a <coughs> Okay. Nice. Um. Sure. You want to pick the next one? Sure. Let's, let's stay with 21 and let's do 200. <laughs> okay. <coughs> what are the four major compartments that make up extracellular fluids? Oh. And what, and most, I'm oh, sorry, is most of the water in the body intracellular or extracellular? Intracellular. Intracellular. 60% what do you say? 60 of the water. Yeah, very good. Good. So the intracellular to this one. Oh, sorry, what is that? Intracellular to this one. Sorry, what is that? Plasma. Yep. Plasma. Yep. Lymph. No. Yeah, lymph. Lymph. Yeah. And. Oh my gosh. I can see the jumping in my head. It's kind of that uh, miscellaneous category. <laughs> <laughs> because it's not like a specific thing. It starts with a T. Um, transcellular. Yes. Transcellular, yes. Transcellular. Good. That <laughs> includes everything like the fluid in your joints, in your eye, it's kind of this mishmash of all that extracellular stuff. Very good. So, four compartments interstitial fluid, <coughs> plasma, lymph, and transcellular fluid. So, 62, I think. Is it 63? Yes. Oh, yeah, I, I, you're right. I, I, this doesn't add up to 100. So that's my, <laughs> that's my problem. I'm sorry. Yeah, most water is intracellular. It should be 63%. All right, good. Okay, let's um, yep, basically all there is to go over on that one. Um, chill. Let's do male for 500. Male? Uh, a patient came in 
to the physician's clinic. This patient is a bodybuilder and admits to using performance enhancing drugs for the past month. You take a blood sample from this patient and measure their hormones. If you were to measure the following levels in the blood, would you expect them to be high, normal, or low? So, GnRH, LH, FSH, and the body's natural testosterone. Gonadotropin releasing hormone, what it stands for? It's secreted by the hypothalamus. Good. LH and FSH. Will they be high? Yes. If these were high, wouldn't this be high? No, no, no because they're not, okay, because he's not producing his own testosterone. But so, yeah, so the FSH is a synthetic testosterone. Low, low. Low, low? Yes. High, low, low? Yeah. Low? Is that your no, final right. answer? That's not right. Because. <laughs> Would it that be normal? I think that would be high and then. Getting the two mixed up, the LH and the FSH, what they do. So the LH and the FSH basically go together. They both go up or they both go down. <coughs> because they're both stimulated by GnRH. I think they will both be low. So they both be high. I think they will both be low. The LH and the FSH? Okay. I think they both be high. You think they'll they both be high? high. Is that high? Yeah, high. If they're stimulated by GnRH, if GnRH is high, then that means they're going to be overstimulated. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be high. Okay. Um, but, will the G but the question is will the GnRH be high or low? Low. Why would it be low? I don't know why. Because <laughs> 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 it would be high because no. there's a lot of testosterone, even though the testosterone is not. Natural, it's still going to be high, even though the natural testosterone is going to be low. The <coughs> overall testosterone is going to be high, so the GnRH is going to be high, and he's looking up at the sky, so I'm wrong. No, uh, yeah, well, yeah. So, <laughs> this whole thing is a what? Is a what? Feedback loop is this? Yeah, negative, negative feedback. feedback loop, right? As yes. we know. And when you, when anyone takes performance enhancing drugs, the body recognizes it as these steroids, right? As, but basically, it recognizes it as testosterone. Okay, even though your body didn't make it. And so, what does what does natural testosterone do to these in light of the fact that this is a negative feedback loop? Please stop producing GnRH. Yeah, testosterone will go up to the hypothalamus and inhibit it, right? And shut down its own production. And in the anterior pituitary, it will also inhibit it. So GnRH, GnRH will be low. LHFSH will also be low. Good. Everything will be low. And the testosterone will be low. Yeah, everything's going to be low, right? Yeah. <laughs> and does that make sense? Yes. <clears throat> All right. Let's see. Oh, it's so sure I was right. Low, 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 low. Okay. Good. So, if you, it's just as simple as know that it's a negative feedback loop. I gave you the picture where they have a whole bunch of testosterone in their blood, and so it's going to naturally inhibit everything. The GnRH like starts everything for LH and FSH. 
Yeah. It stimulates the LAQ hypothalamus. Yes. The hypothalamus the secretes the yeah. all releasing hormones for the anterior pituitary are secreted by the hypothalamus, in this case GnRH. LHFSH come from the anterior pituitary. Yep, and under the direction of this, these get released. They go down to the testicle, release testosterone. So, had this patient not been taking all of the Yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you another example here. It's gonna challenge that. Okay. But, How are you? No, I was just saying, what would constitute a, a high testosterone? Would it be an overactive pituitary, um, or? Yeah, like let, let's say let's say you had a, a tumor in your hypothalamus, or let's say you had a tumor in your pituitary, and it secreted way too much LH and MSH. <coughs> and like I've said briefly before, when you have a tumor of an endocrine tissue that secretes a certain hormone, even though that cell <coughs> normally reacts in a negative feedback loop and will be inhibited, if it's a tumor, it won't be inhibited. Right? Does that make sense? Not really. What if you didn't have a pituitary gland at all? If you didn't have a pituitary gland, you can miss lots of hormones. And you have to take hormone therapy. Like I have, yeah. I have a friend whose son does not have hormone therapy. They removed it. Yeah, you can. I mean, I'm but. sure that there are supplements, that, or like <coughs> pharmaceuticals that would help with that. Yeah, intervene. I'm not sure. That's a good question for like an well, endocrinologist. I mean, when it happens to women, they just take estrogen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm so, gonna ask them now. That's good. Ask All right. So here's another question. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Um. So what's the supplement? Why take performance enhancing drugs? Yeah, because like, or I guess like maybe not why. How is that increasing? Like if all of these are low, aren't those the things that you would need to like? Isn't it bad if those are low? Like what? Yeah. Like how are they performing better? How are they like building well, they're more muscle or whatever? Is it like more hot steroids? Yes. Okay. Yep. So, but yeah, one of the side effects for like bodybuilders is they could become infertile because okay. all this is low, right? That makes sense? Can it, be, can it be reversed if they like stop taking it? Yeah, because it is just a negative feedback loop. You remove the one thing that means it'll start up again. Yep, so the test, like in the testicle, it, it kind of makes sense. Testosterone production, everything goes down. Testosterone is the one we're focusing on now, but also spermatogenesis is also going down. Does that make sense? So we're not making as much um, of that. Okay? Testosterone does affect your sex drive as well, right? Or no? Mm -hmm. it's, okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, so here's, here's my next... Uh, here's my next scenario here, okay? Let me think about it real quick. Um, <coughs> a person comes into the clinic and they have a So this person has a buffalo hump, uh, moon faces, what? thin limbs, moon face? 
yeah, moon phase, magic round phase, and buffalo hump, and yeah, so those are kind of your classic symptoms. They're, they've gained a little bit of, a, a good amount of weight in the last six months. Yeah, Cushing syndrome is what you're thinking of, right? Moon faces, buffalo hump, uh, kind of deter you know, depletion in the limbs. Good. Um, so, you would expect what hormone to be high for Cushing syndrome? It starts with a C as well. Yes, good. So, you take a, um, you say, okay, I'm concerned about Cushing syndrome, so I'm gonna do a hormone panel, right? You look at all their hormones, you check their ACTH level, Say your CRH and then your cortisol. And you find out, and this person has also been experiencing some headaches off and on. And that's what you find from your analysis. CRH is low, super low. ACTH is high. CRH is a releasing hormone, similar to GnRH, <coughs> but just for the cortisol. Yep. So this is secreted by no. So it's the same as that one. So hypothalamus. Yeah, hypothalamus. ACTH is secreted by. Anterior pituitary and cortisol secreted by adrenal. your adrenal glands. Okay, good. So, if this was the, what you found from your labs, what would be the cause of this person's Cushing syndrome? So, they have all the classic features of Cushing syndrome. They also have this these headaches that have been worsening for six months. And remember, negative feedback loop. Still at play. So this is, this is this is like an abnormal picture, right? But we're trying to figure out what about this is abnormal, and what could be causing it all. So would it be is it the hypothalamus that's abnormal? Is it not the releasing hormone? Or no, it's the pituitary. Because if the hypothalamus is low, something's not computing between the two, and the anterior pituitary is saying, "Screw you, I'm doing whatever I want, and I'm going to be high." Which makes because it's the it's it's the flow chart, right? Mm -hmm. So there's something in between those two, the hypothalamus and the anti anterior pituitary. But I think it's the anterior. Oh my gosh, I can't say anything. I got you. I think it's the pituitary gland because it should be receiving the signal from the hypothalamus that it's too low. So it could be like a tumor, which is causing it to secrete more of the AC. We all agree, we agree on that? That is correct. Yeah. Yeah. So the pituitary, because you're right. Normally, if there's low releasing hormone, you would expect, well, like TRH ACTH. in this case, you would expect ACTH to be low. Right? Right. But it's not in this case. So you were right to notice that. If ACTH is high, would you expect cortisol to be high? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Would. And if cortisol is high, would you expect CRH to be low? No. Would you? Negative feedback. Negative Right? Because cortisol, just like all of, like testosterone, goes back and inhibits its own production, right? So you're right. This is correct. If I have high cortisol, you would expect there to be low CRH. Would you expect there to be high ACTH? No, because this is supposed to inhibit that, right? Good. 
So, what's likely happening in this situation, just like you admit, <coughs> it's likely a pituitary tumor that is hypersecreting ACTH and doesn't respond to the negative feedback. Hypothalamus is fine. It's responding like it should. You got way too much ACTH. So, in this case, they would likely get imaging of the head, MRI, something like that, and see a mass in the adrenal gland, the, the tumor. And it would be surgically corrected and be okay. Oh, is it time for, oh, thank you. Let's take a break, okay? And uh, let me know if you have any questions about this. I'm just doing this to reinforce the negative feedback loop. And